When the media outlet Roka News launched in the year 2020, it started creating just about every kind of content you can imagine. There was a newsletter, a podcast, and accounts on every single social media platform. But this everything but the kitchen sink approach didn't seem to work, so the founders decided to focus mostly on a single platform, Instagram. Over the next two years, they leveraged Instagram's visual storytelling features to deliver a digestible form of news to its young followers. This singular focus allowed it to grow to over 1.1 million followers. Then, starting in 2022, it branched out into other mediums. It reinvested in its daily newsletter and also launched a TikTok account where it publishes more humorous, entertainment-focused content. It also started building a dedicated mobile app, which it's launching soon. In this episode, I interviewed co-founder Max Tui about the Roka News origin story, its Instagram growth, and how it's begun monetizing its content. Hi, I'm Simon Owens, and this is The Business of Content, the show about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. Let's jump into my interview with Max. But first, let me tell you about my sponsor, Memberful. Ready to create a deeper connection with your audience? By writing a paid newsletter, launching a private podcast, or creating a paid Discord community, membership gives you the opportunity to have a more direct and deeper connection with your audience. Memberful allows you to take full control and ownership of your content, your audience, your brand, and your membership. Whether you are building a community of technology lovers like Leo and Lisa Laporte from This Week in Tech, or examining the harmony between data and art like Sherry Hu from Water and Music, Sharing your passion with your audience is easier than ever with Memberful's host of built-in tools and integrations. Memberful has everything you need to run a membership program, including in-house newsletters, private podcasts, custom branding, gift subscriptions, Apple Pay, Google Pay, free and paid trials, referrals, and tons more. Plus, Memberful seamlessly integrates with tools you already use, like WordPress, MailChimp, and Discord. Visit memberful.com slash Simon Owens to get started today. I'll leave a link in the description. Okay, now on to my interview with Max. Hey, Max, thanks for joining me. Simon, great to be here. Thank you for having me. So we're here to talk about the company that you co-founded. It's called Roka mm-hmm. News. Uh, mm-hmm. But your first introduction into media came in the think tank world, right? Like, what, How did that come about? Exactly. So uh, before Roka News started, uh, my first full-time job out of college was at a think tank in Washington, D.C. And, you know, think tanks are their own world. You know, the policy world, research, very inside baseball in terms of, you know, D.C. and center workings. And uh, that was my job. And I actually worked corporate fundraising and then uh eventually came to host it uh my institute's official podcast so and it was like a right of center economics think tank right it's primarily economics and foreign policy exactly right it's it's one of the um uh it's it's probably the leading center right think tank in dc and called the american enterprise institute and great place to be as a young person incredible free lunches so uh what more can you ask for so you start there right out of college, right? Right. And it's kind of like a basic entry level job. And exactly. you get to work on their podcast, which is a pretty freak, you know, as someone who came up, you know, I'm probably a little bit older than you. That's a pretty mm-hmm. cool job to just kind of suddenly find yourself into. How did that happen? Totally. It came <laughs> out of nowhere. Uh, and I, this is where I'm going to have to introduce one of my other two co-founders, Max Frost, because he was the one who let me in. So Max uh, was a couple years ahead of me in school, and he was working in the foreign policy research department. And for whatever reason, uh, they decide to give the official podcast to young staffers. That had always been the tradition. I think it was because, you know, the uh, median age of the actual thinkers at the think tank is a little older. So when they hear podcasts, hmm, you know, it, it was kind of like it <laughs> we'll was let kind the of young people after- do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is what the young people it's, it's probably. Yeah. Like a lot of people who were lucky to be part of social media teams in 2015 when everybody yeah. started pushing a Facebook or the first person at a publication to be like, hey, I, I, we should start a TikTok. Is you're able to carve out kind of luckily, uh, va- you know, a spot for your own valuable real estate. So um, he became the host of it. Uh, and uh, eventually I actually asked him if I could be involved somehow and they needed a guest host one day. And I stepped in and it was Wonderful. So I owe it all 
to Max Frost and his co-host uh, Matt Winesett. So shout out Max and Matt. That's how it happened, and you're exactly right. We didn't deserve it. Uh, <laughs> it kind of came out of nowhere, and we just knew it was a great opportunity, and and we had a blast doing it. And what was the format of the podcast? So we would have a, an intro, uh, you know, kind of typical uh, previewing the guest and the subject for that day. And then we would go straight into interviews. So it was almost an all interview podcast. And we got to talk to just uh, some incredible writers, some incredible guests um, from uh, Nick Kristoff to Brett Stevens to Andrew Sullivan, um, Caitlin Flanagan at The Atlantic. Uh, Jeb Bush, Paul Ryan. It was a really uh, great group. And to your earlier point, it was we knew it was a great launching pad. And um, in terms of you know speaking to people, we never would have been able to speak with otherwise. So it was it was yeah because you didn't have like a huge audience, but you were able to get yeah. um, you were able to get really high profile people because it was associated with AEI. Exactly right. It, there's a weird difference that you don't see anywhere in the media market, but certainly in DC between prestige and kind of commercial or popular uh, reach and AEI's high on the prestige rank and they care more about quality eyeballs or in this case ears uh, rather than, you know, it's, it's a very, um, it, it's one reason, you know, I liked being a part of it, but it's certainly not what I was more interested, in, which is reaching kind of the masses um, it's, it's much more high end, you know, uh, let's get into the weeds of, you know, NATO or, uh, monetary policy. So what years were you running or working on the podcast and how much did it grow while you were there? So I, uh, started there. It was, it was really not that long of a stint. It was September, 2021, uh, to about, uh, April of of, or sorry, September 2019 to April of, of 2020. So it was right before the pandemic. We had about four or five months pre-pandemic and then a little bit into the pandemic, which I don't know, were you doing your podcast during the pandemic, the Zoom? Yeah. Were you already in kind of a, a remote format? Because for a lot of people, it was like a, it was a weird adjustment doing the Zoom routine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was I've been working from home since 2014, so I've been, oh, so you yeah. started this trend. You've yeah. been on it, yeah. yeah. Well, anyways, it was it was about six seven months of of hosting it, and it grew from about uh, 2,200 listeners uh, a week, uh, and we usually publish an episode a week to about uh, seven eight thousand. So by the it, in the heyday pre like I would say our peak was around January. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it tapered off in the pandemic, but it, it, it grew pretty significantly and all organically. And that doesn't sound impressive if you're used to like YouTube numbers, but for a yeah. policy, po uh, you know, right. uh, uh, right. to, uh, you know, an arcane policy podcast, those are pretty, pretty good numbers. I think uh, it's so vegetables you're, you're selling, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's everybody eat the vegetables on the plate. That's what policy podcasts are. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. you and your co-founders, you eventually leave to to launch what is now Roka News. Mm -hmm. what, tell me, through, walk me through that kind of decision making pro process and who who were your co-founders? Absolutely. So there are three of us. Um, there's Max. Oh, <laughs> believe it or not, two of the three of us are named Max. Uh, and that was my co-host uh, on the podcast. And so we always had we had the most three boring names you could have. It was welcome back to Bantered AI. We are Max, Max, and Matt. That those were the three names. It was unbelievable. <laughs> uh, and then so he was one of them, Max Frost. Um, and uh, he and I through the podcast experience. Um, he's from upstate New York. Went to UVA after college. He worked in in uh, in India um, and worked for a think tank. Did a lot of or sorry, a startup. Did a lot of writing over there. Um, and just a fascinating, incredibly smart guy. I mean, it was unbelievably lucky, A, that he brought me on board the podcast, but B, getting to know him. Uh, and we just kind of had the, a natural creative energy that we knew we wanted to do something with. So at AEI, um, starting in the new year of 2020, before the pandemic, I remember we would have late nights at, at the think tank uh, on the whiteboard, uh, coming up with business ideas, workshopping a lot. So there was already that creative energy and excitement and he motivated me um and so come around to uh uh april late april we were thinking 
the media is a mess. Um, and not just for the typical reasons you hear of the bias, the alarmism, the relentless negativity, but from a delivery perspective, cable news, paywalled websites, this isn't how people want to consume information now. So we got to thinking, what would it look like to deliver news in a much more healthy, easy, and enjoyable way? So that was our entire thought. I remember from the first day we had a phone call about this problem until now. So this is April 2020 to now August 22. We haven't stopped a day working on this. And uh, for the beginning, it was informal. And obviously, since August 2020, it's been formal. So a, about a, a few weeks into this, my best friend from college, Billy Carney, who I've lived with for three years, he was doing investment bank in New York. And we all had, I'm sure this is a theme you probably heard from a lot of these media startups, is we all had problems with where we're coming from. I mean, we're all incredibly grateful with the experiences we had, but there are frustrations. I mean, who wouldn't, you know, have have some frustrations and eagerness to run, especially if you have, you know, high ambitions for the future. And ours at the think tank was, it's so esoteric. It's so inside DC. They're performing for, you know, a, a very specific group of people, not the masses. And then Billy, you're working uh, at, an, at a great, hard to get job, but terrible hours. You're working on PowerPoints all day, moving around. And so we were like, we uh, want to do something meaningful that we're really excited about every day. And for us, that was trying to create a me uh, news media company that appealed to young people. Just that simple. So those were the three of us, Max. Uh, my co-host, um, Billy, best friend from college, uh, and we all quit our jobs and we said, let's start Roka News. And so talk talk to me about like what you initially launched because it was very right. different than what it came to be. It started out as a podcast, right? That was a key part. Ironically, we were doing more then than we're doing now. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. You kind of uh, were playing, you were playing the entire spread of possible mediums. Exactly. Oh, Twitter. Let's get that. Instagram. Let's get that. Facebook podcast website. Uh, let's hire a small staff of part-time writers. We did it all. Yeah. And what made you decide to kind of dial back that ambition and, and focus on a single medium? It was, were we doing any of them really well? No, we weren't. And, and also we kind of had uh, an epiphany on our mission of, okay, we're talking about all these outdated media companies, yet we use their the exact same channel. Sure, our content's different. And we did have a content identity that was coming to fruition uh, or th that was becoming stronger and clearer and, and more unique every day. But we weren't we weren't really asking first principles questions about how are we going to bring our mission to life? So when you're not asking first principle questions, you're all of a sudden going to imitate what everyone on the market's doing. So of course you'd be on all those platforms. But when we really thought, how would you reach a 26 year old who's disenchanted with the news and isn't really political one way or the other, frustrated by it all? How would you reach that person? And we realized Instagram, that's the most, especially at the time, the most engaged social platform for kind of our tour, our, our core group of 25 to 28 year olds. So we thought, okay, Let's call. Let's craft a news product for Instagram, and what we thought that looked like would be a meme or kind of relatable cover on it on one of the stories of the day, the four need to know stories with four bullet points, and then every day one or two fascinating deep dives on a random subject for that curiosity element to just kind of cultivate a wonder about the world and learn more, um, instead of just spending all your days thinking about DC political th theater and culture work. So that's what we worked on. End of yeah, Christmas time, 2020. And by the new year, we ran with Instagram. We cut everything back. We cut the writers. We cut the podcast. Uh, as much as I love podcasts, they're the best. Uh, but we <laughs> just wanted to focus. And we went all in on Instagram and newsletter. So let's talk about the format you developed on Instagram. So basically, you take advantage of Instagram's album feature. So And the first image... Right. is like a arresting image with a, a really catchy headline using the same best practices right. that lots of news sites use with with uh, headlines. And then as you click through it, it's basically kind of almost like a still projection of, you know, walking them through the news. So a series of images with, I'm, I'm guessing you're trying to keep the text to a minimal just enough to ex to kind of walk the the user to get the kind of basic facts about whatever the news or the the thing you're trying to explain. 
Exactly. Uh, the, the first to your first point about the general format, the album carousel feature. We, the irony of trying to be innovative is we ended up going back to the newspaper basics. It was you have a catchy cover and we stray from clickbait or alarmism like a lot of covers tend. Uh, and instead we went for, OK, we're on Instagram, a place that's dominated by memes and flashy pictures. So let's kind of make something fun, relatable about the news. And we would sprinkle in pop culture or meme references that were also clear to our target demographic. We're one of you. You know, it wasn't like we're, you know, a bunch of people from an older generation in an editorial room thinking, how do we reach young people? We're one of you. So that was kind of the first thing we realized is having a cover that's attention grabbing that fits the Instagram format, but it ended up kind of functioning like a newspaper. You flip to the first page, it gives an overview of the four stories, the headlines and a, a picture for each. And then you go one by one and you're right, text minimal and uh, focusing on the facts. One thing we learned about the bullet point format is it allows you to keep it down the fairway a little more. When you read, you know, written form on a lot of websites and magazines, uh, I think it's that style that makes it difficult to be unbiased when you have to kind of write in a prose format versus bullet points where it just this happened, one number, one quote. And then critics will say this, supporters say that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of format has worked really well for us. So you decide in December 2020 to focus solely on the Instagram account. You shut right. down everything else. Right. Talk, walk me through, how did you start finding followers? What was kind of the growth trajectory? Because you now have over 1.1 million followers on right. Instagram. Walk me through that kind of journey. Well, it, it, it started product first. I think there's an eagerness whenever you try something new or um, when you, you know, even with something that's existing, you want your numbers to get high uh, immediately. You're always numbers obsessed. Have we grown? Have we done this? We decided early on, and this was a piece of advice we got from someone, and it ended up being unbelievably helpful. We realized early on that you should never market something that people don't love. It's just that simple. So our first priority before thinking about growth in that December, January period was how do you cultivate and build something that people love? And for us, it was honing that format, trying different styles of stories, and it ended up getting to the point where there was organic growth and people who came to the page stayed and they engaged. And immediately we saw people like this. So one of the things we did besides all the organic growth we had, which was incredible, was we would sometimes, um, you know, send one of our stories to a partner account and they'd put it on their uh, story on Instagram and you you get people checking out your profile. Huh, Roka News. This, And one thing we learned that was interesting, and Instagram, by the way, changed the algorithm to make this less convenient, is we learned that being private allowed for more follows than being public. And that's simple human psychology. People are intrigued and also they mean if you're public or anyone can view your content archive, there's even if you like it for whatever reason, you feel like the threshold to hit that follow button's high. So you're going to be less likely to do it. But if you just want to see it and so you're like, all right, I'll request the follow. They're private. Then all of a sudden you, you're now following it, and the same barrier th to hit that button exists for unfollowing. And fortunately, our retention was around 95% from everyone who came to our page from something like this. And it, it spoke to, I think, the content and the appetite people have for news that isn't just about culture war or um, you know some, some hot-button theatric. So let's break this down for my audience because I actually know what you're talking about. I've talked to like, you know, purveyors of like meme accounts on Instagram. Right. So what they do is they lock down the account so they need to request access. Right. And from what I understand is then if they see some kind of viral meme or something they want to DM to their friend, right. they DM the, the meme to their friend. But because the account is locked, locked in, in order for the friend to 
see that content they have to follow they can't just passively consume it so right. you know these meme account creators they talk about like exponential growth because every time they created something that was semi-viral where friends felt compelled to dm it to their friends then all of a sudden that would create a wave of follows whereas if it wasn't locked down those people would just look at your content and maybe move on without following totally it, it, it's 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 really remarkable and one Instagram knew this was going on and they stopped it actually. So for that, what you're talking about for the DMing, let's see a viral meme or in our case, a viral story on something just bizarre or super interesting. And like we had a couple that went viral early on and like the, the inventor of ramen noodles and some stories of th that were just kind of crazy, whether true crime or something bizarre around the world. And so people would send it to their friend. And when we were private, initially, you would see a preview of the post and then be able to click on it and be like, oh, private account. Then Instagram in 2021 change it so that you'd send it and it would show post unavailable. So all you they would see is now post unavailable. And so there was less of that hook. But that was an unbelievable growth tactic. And by the way, that speaks to anybody trying to grow a social brand, whether personal or business. And this is largely from learning from other people who've done it better than we have, is you always have to respond to algorithm changes uh, and always get ready for the fact that whatever is working now won't work tomorrow. Even people who are early on the Reels curve, they're already talking about how Reels is converting fewer followers now than it used to. And the, the, the days of you know getting 300% the views compared to your followers for real, those are – so you're always responding to what Instagram does. Did you get featured because you were doing topical stuff on the Discover page at all? We would and sometimes not. You know, we uh, we we would for when we were public because you can't be featured on Discover when you're private. But even when we were public, I we've noticed that Instagram has toned down the news content, and they and, and it's no coincidence we saw that Meta laid off its news partnership team. I think uh, either earlier this month or in July. Um, so it's harder to get noticed from the explore page as a news account. Um, but we, we benefited more from the kind of our followers sharing content and we are so grateful to our followers. We'd be not, we'd be nowhere without them. And, um, yeah, we're, we're so grateful to everyone who, 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 who does share our stuff. And then you also benefited because you were early on to the meme stock craze, right? With the, with the GameStop. That was the first time we saw real viral potential and that was like 2021 early 2021 exactly right yeah. i want to say march april ish april maybe um when when that was at its peak which i don't know about you simon but looking back it feels like a different lifetime uh now but when amc uh and gamestop craze with wall street bets at its peak i think one thing that benefited is people whether explicitly or they just kind of sensed it they knew we were of their the Reddit generation where we knew what a subreddit was. We didn't have to Google it. We didn't have to ask, uh, you know, our nephew, like, <laughs> kind of get the vibe at, at some of the larger outlets. And I think we inherently uh, picked up on the fact that it was a big story for our generation. It felt like a real clash of powers uh, between the people, as some people saw it, and, and larger institutions that seemed to conspire against kind of what was a fun uh, internet subculture becoming ballooning into something huge. And it was kind of like, you know, team Wall Street bets. Or, and we didn't take a side, but we knew that we'd cover it. Um, and it was just fun to cover. And I think whether it was the language we used or the covers we picked, it was clear people were like, okay, they understand what's going on. And this is an issue we trust them to cover as opposed to someone who only found out was it a subreddit was the week before. So can you give me a sense of like how fast the Instagram account grew? Sure. We, uh, it was pretty remarkable, um, but it grew from about, uh, I think at the beginning of April, we had 66,000 followers. It was either beginning of, I remember that number, it was either beginning of March or April. And then by uh, August 25, 2021, we had uh, a million. So it grew from that uh, in about four to five months, um, it grew all, uh, you know, 934,000. Um, and 
it was really exponential and we ended up going public after that um after a lot of the private growth and um because going we all public the on the instagram account not you exactly. didn't have an ipo <laughs> Right, right. Not. <laughs> Dang it! Why is New York Stock Exchange that? no? Uh, we we that's exactly right. We went public on the Instagram, which to us felt like an IPO because it was you know in our world it was a big. Uh, it was something we we had kind of like waited for for a while, and uh, we we do feel that for a news account, there's some inherent value to being publicly accessible and to have people share you on their story. Uh, even if it were to hurt growth. And and we had a ton of our people requesting it. They would DM us. They would comment, can this be public? Can this be public? Um, and we, we, we think there's some kind of general value of, of to that. So you started with all these different uh, content verticals. Then you right. consolidated into Instagram. You have since started to branch out again. Right. Talk, right. W- when did that start happening and what? how did you start doing that? Absolutely. First of all, totally. The the the, uh, the phase is just as you describe it. It was kind of like the tide was out, then it came in, focused on just two things, Instagram and a little bit the newsletter. It was background mm-hmm. noise, but we still put it out and sent that email every day. And then now the tide's coming out again because we feel like we can, um, it, you know, we felt ready to expand. Uh, a, we got the resources to do so. And B, we felt that um, we wanted a better newsletter. Uh, and so we really have invested in the newsletter, our Roka current, which now has, uh, coming up on 200,000 subscribers. It's grown tremendously this year. Uh, we decided to get a sports page. Uh, we think that a lot of the issues that affect, uh, the political news industry also affect the sports news industry, especially how content's delivered, where you either have this kind of meme internet option for news or this paywalled athletic ESPN insider option and so we thought there was an opportunity for great sports storytelling that's substantive but exists for free on instagram uh and also go into video a little more so the other aspect too is we thought about who our target audience was and who loves roca and we thought they'd love sports and so that page our 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 roca sports instagram page uh whose handle is at ride the bench for any listeners interested in seeing what that's like it has a it it, launched on march 29 and today it has 105,000 followers uh really great engagement um and then we also launched a tiktok the reason for that was we want to showcase our office culture we want people to see who's behind the news and show a level of relatability a lot of young people of my generation and below feel that most news companies operate behind a glass barrier. There's them, there's a huge glass barrier, and then there's you. We want to break that glass barrier and show a level of relatability, personalization, personal personability that uh, some of the legacy outlets don't provide. So we got the sports page, we got the TikTok, and now we're building an app. That's the main thing. So we got a great tech team, and our point of the app is to gamify the news experience. To date, you're only able to influence content on newsletter and Instagram, but the app allows you to control the whole experience, everything from what it looks like to what the process of getting information is and no more junk on the, on the, on the, um, in the experience. So you sort of alluded to this, but you, you raised capital in order to do this expansion, right? Yeah. When was that? And what was kind of the pitch there? Our pitch was the tech. We uh, had a foundation for uh, content and a proof of concept that people love our mission. There's incredible appetite for it from people on both sides of the uh, ends of the political spectrum and in between, uh, and also many different age groups. So there's an incredible appetite. Two, with a tech component, we'd be able to uh, deliver our content with a much better experience. We had a really good, we felt, vision for what that would look like and what people wanted. Um, and then we also pitched a path to, um, you know, to expanding across channels and really uh, speaking to the people we set out to reach. Um, who, you know, it's funny, our biggest cities are New York and LA. Obviously, they're the biggest cities in the country, but we have a big following, which was our goal in states like Ohio, Wisconsin, Georgia, Texas, um, a lot of purple states, and just kind of states where there aren't many media companies where people perceive that the coastal media companies don't really care about them. And our mission is to reach those people. And I think that's close to home for some of us. 
Max Frost from upstate New York. I was born in Tallahassee, Florida. Billy's a Jersey man, but you know, we, we went to college in Indiana. And so we just want to, and, and, you know, we have family all over. So th that was something that we were very interested in. And we found a couple investors who would help with the tech side. Ori alone, who founded Compass Real Estate um, and has a terrific track record of investing. He's incredible. We've learned so much from him and a number of other investors who are uh, politically neutral and want to be part of a media company that's going to, um, that's going to, we hope, dominate the market for young people and hopefully improve mental health along the way. So that's what they saw. And, and that's what we're trying to do right now. So with the TikTok account, it looks like you are kind of branching out beyond, the, you know, what you were doing with the Instagram account right. in the sense of it seems to be at least somewhat more entertainment focused. I watched one video where you're going around, looks like Central Park or some some park in New York City yeah. and asking random people what their celebrity doppelganger right. is. And, you know, you're surprised by how how closely they matched uh, some of those right. celebrities. That were Who is your celebrity lookalike? Gotten Chris Evans. 100% see that. Get Jane from Breaking Bad. Yeah. Got Gal Gadot? Yeah, would you say so? Shawn Mendes. Shawn Mendes. Steph Curry. <laughs> Nessa Hudgens. Who are your celebrity lookalikes? Winona Ryder. 100%. Shit. Chief Keith. There's another funny one I watched where it was, uh, you were going around your own offices and asked, it was a, it was a female who was asking all the men in the offices what they got their moms for Mother's Day. It's obvious that they're not actually very well prepared or <laughs> thinking it through very quickly. It's funny, funny. So like, is that the idea? Is it like you're, I mean, obviously you're there to inform, but you're also trying to kind of play with different things. I, I, I don't know if you saw this, but I had uh the guy running the strategy for morning brew on and yeah. how he uses yeah. yes he's explaining the news but he's trying to do entertainment humor stuff like that is that kind of your thinking there exactly uh so it's i i'm first of all uh uh it's apologies to all mothers out there <laughs> after the roca news tiktok on what we were getting our moms for mother's day listen everybody here's what i will say though on that because everybody in the comments is like oh they're oh classic son not putting any thought into this and they only asked the office guys by the way what they were getting for their moms so the guys got roasted but one of them said paul mccartney tickets and he got all the love in the comments and now he's he's a big hit among uh middle-aged women on tiktok now uh but yeah he that was a fun experience and the celebrity looked like when we walked up to a guy who looked a, a lot like chris evans but also a funny distance from chris evans where we were just like oh who's your celebrity look like and we did that with a bunch of people in the park our goal with that is absolutely enter entertainment. I think one thing we learned on Instagram is wherever you go, whenever you go to a new platform, you got to think about what works there. What's the language there? What's the purpose of it? And on TikTok, we do ask people their um, thoughts on, on a pressing issue of the day, whether it's um, the FBI's, you know, search warrant raid, whatever you call it in, in on Mar-a-Lago uh, or, you know, any, any, any real pressing issue ask them what they think of it, but then also have a, a level of entertainment. I think one thing that newspapers understood is, is you want the substance, you want the kind of meat, potatoes, and vegetables of news, but offer a little dessert, you know, offer the crossword puzzle, the Sudoku. And for us on, as a news company, TikTok allows us to do some of that with more entertaining ones or who's the greatest athlete of all time. What's your red flag, you know, asking people in the park, um, and I, 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 our goal there is just to be ourselves and to just have fun with people. And we intend to take that on the road. So the t and, and Morning Brew's done a, a good job with the personality who, you know, it's also not very like it's not like you're going to get an in-depth knowledge of what's going on with uh, inflation when the guy on more Morning Brew acts out of skip. But it's engagement with the news. It's a news story that you're engaging with. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, I think that's how, how to succeed on TikTok. And so you mentioned the newsletter. I mean, I, I think th there's a lot in common with you and Morning Brew and you and the hustle, you and the skim and the sense of it's like mm -hmm. this kind of breezy conversational way of delivering mm -hmm. the news deliver, you know, formatted mm -hmm. for a younger generation. It seems like you're taking the newsletter really seriously now in terms of growing that out, I'm guessing because you have more ownership over the audience and it's probably better for ad delivery. You know, you have first party data, different stuff like that is what's kind of your, how are you growing that? Have you started hiring writers for it? What's the, what's the strategy there? We, you know, on the writer front, we did hire a writer recently, but it's really been the same crew that was doing it um, 
it, you know, when we started and there were a couple thousand readers and most of them were uh, our friends from college and random people we've met on sidewalks who'd want to sign up. So uh, it's really the same crew on the content side. We've learned a lot then. But in terms of why we're investing on the platform, a couple reasons. The first is newsletters are great. They're very fun to write and read. Uh, and you really get a sense of community. We have hundreds of emails every day. Last Friday, we had 700 emails from readers. We ask them question of the day every day. On Friday, we do 20 questions. And newsletters are a great way to be very personal, fun, uh, and lighthearted with the news. And to your point, conversational. You know, whenever there are difficult stories, you deliver. And for every major story, we have four need to knows at the top. We always go fact based bullet points. But for the rest of the newsletter, there's a lot of room for personality and fun news and information and community engagement. So we just love the email format. Um, the other thing is about the email format is you don't have to worry at all about uh, tech censorship. Now, we're not a shop that's putting out any outrageous material, but we've had covers taken down for. Uh, or posts on Instagram taken down and it flags our account for one had to do with, we were doing a story on Viagra and there was a study about Viagra is linked to reducing the risk of Alzheimer's was the study. Uh, and we did a cover on it. Um, and, and it was, it, we, since as, as, as mentioned earlier, we kind of do fun meme type covers. And so we had the famous picture of Albert Einstein writing on the chalkboard. And uh, instead of whatever he was writing, I can't remember what we had him write Viagra. Yeah, And that was taken down um, for promotion of prescription drug and it flags your account and it hurts yeah. you in the algorithm. It makes you unsearchable for a bit. We've had others where we do a rap on like the pro, uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan and the uh, return of the Taliban and a post where if you just have on one of your slides, a picture of the Taliban and it's kind of random how this happens. They'll take the post down just because you're depicting an extremist group or whatever Instagram says. So all that's to say, we're a company that tries to keep it down the middle. You know, we do a couple, if not three posts every day. And we've done that for a long, long time. And you have a few that take down and, and that can ruin your account. It can put you in the penalty box with searches and everything. Insta uh, newsletters are just much, much better for delivering content without uh, that kind of restriction. So I think there's always been, Simon, I'm not sure what you hear from other um, media people, and I, you know, read your sub deck, so I have at least a general sense. But to to be concerned about censorship, I think used to be an issue of okay, are you saying radical things? That was like the issue. Are you okay? Come on, but are are you you're pushing the envelope, aren't you? Today, it's really not that. I hear it from people all the time. They'll post yeah. banal stuff that gets flagged and hurts your standing on the platform. Yeah, I mean, not to get political, but I think like, you know, if you look at the debate like five, six years ago, it was over abuse and harassment and how do we, right. you know, stop that, you know, especially on like places like Twitter. Right. And I think during the COVID era, there's like certain factions that got a little bit too trigger happy and pushing the platforms to be much more hands on in terms of moderating oh. content. But then they get surprised when, I mean, that has to scale. That's scaling to billions of users. And right. when you scale something like that, there's going to be a lot of false positives. And totally. so I'm hearing from more and more of these companies that are like, you know, I'm not really posting anything that radical, but I might make an off-color joke where I'm not being serious, but they take it for being serious or different stuff like that. And then that gets caught in a content filter and some contractor is getting paid $15 an hour in Atlanta who's being outsourced by Accenture or something like that is, you know, flagging that and locking down your account and stuff like that. So I think that's definitely something that needs to be taken into account as we discuss the expansion of these kind of, you know, moderating content beyond the initial purview of just looking for kind of like abuse and harassment and stuff like that. 100% on the false positives point. And that's a, something we've also learned is we've had even more posts that are taken down and then you appeal and whoever it goes to that's next to like, oh, this actually wasn't bad. Yeah. And so sometimes the false pa positives are, are undone immediately, which is great. And we have to have this happen on TikTok too. We've had a few taken down that go back up. And it really is, you know, on the one hand, you like to see that they're investing more in, in better censorship, AKA, you know, figuring out which are the good ones, which are the bad ones. But in reality, it's often led to more mistakes where you have, you know, lower level people 
making decisions that affect your entire audience and business. Yeah. Uh, you're definitely not the first person I've had on my podcast that's talked about that. Um, yeah. So you've mentioned that you launched a sports vertical on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Is that the strategy eventually? You know, do you look at not to, sorry for, I mean, I'm sure you don't mind the the comparison since it's a high profile company, but Morning Brew has now started to go into more B and B, mm-hmm. B, B2B verticals and stuff like that, expanded into different, you know, comedy, different stuff like that. Is the eventually the broken news tech, broken news business, like, is that the, is that the end goal? We definitely want to cover more content areas. And I think one thing Morning Brew especially has done well and other media companies across the time and done well is figure out what you're really good at and double down on that. And so for them, it was, I, I don't know the timeline of when they launched these different newsletters, but having subscribed to them for a while, it was where they launched the retail brew uh, morning newsletter, emerging tech, and they kind of first doubled down on newsletters and they started to get a social presence, but newsletter was what they did really well. So our thinking was people like our storytelling style on Instagram. What if we apply it to sports? What if we apply it to a new area? Our long-term vision is um, it, it's not going to be realized by getting a bunch of new verticals on Instagram, kind of like Complex Media has done. We be- we are really doubling down on the tech and newsletter. We believe those are both terrific products that have long-term upside. Um, but but to answer your question, we do want to cover more content areas. Um, and I think branching off on any platform where you have a ton of success is what you is what we intend to do. Um, and our goal is to reach people with quality news in an enjoyable, easy way. So to do that on Instagram in a, in a as meaningful way as possible means covering more area. So that is a you know something we eventually hope to do. So you uh, you focus mainly on curation aggregation mm-hmm. of news. You know, going back to the mar- you know Morning Brew, they certainly have started to hire journalists who are doing kind of longer form content on their website. There's they're mark they have a they have a reporter I'm, I'm blanking on his name for for Marketing Brew that is doing like some in- amazing investigative journalism on like ad- scammy ad tech and scammy marketers and stuff like that. Do you think you're heading down that route at all in terms of doing more kind of long form content? Absolutely. We've already started um, back to Max Frost, the co-founder on the podcast who went to India before, uh, before working at AI. And uh, he has uh, done a number of trips that he documents on the newsletter. They're very popular with our readers And we put them out there a little bit on Instagram as well. But he went to Ukraine in summer 21 before the war, of course. And then he went to Ukraine earlier this year during the war. And then he just crossed the Amazon and documented it all. So it's been really remarkable to see the feedback on his experiences, meeting refugees in Ukraine, kind of getting a feel within the country. He not only was doing it from the Polish Ukrainian border and Romanian Ukrainian border, but actually in the country, talking to people, experiencing towns, visiting some of the families and friends he had made on his previous trip before anything really happened. And um, that was terrific. And seeing what he did crossing the Amazon, we want to do a lot of stuff domestically too, travel to different places, cover different stories. And one of our philosophies here when it comes to investigative is every time people go to certain regions, whether global or globally or domestically, they often are always looking for the most depressing stories. So I remember that feeling in Western Pennsylvania when people would come and the only time they'd ever cover stories, if it was like depressing about steel towns, I mean, there are a lot of great, interesting aspects to different communities in the U S and abroad. And similarly with the Amazon, everyone's like, Oh, cartel, cartel, cartel. Oh, uh, rainforest destruction. That's it. That's it. Uh, and all these issues. And our, our thing was, yes, we'll cover those. Absolutely. They're important. Some are very sad. But to, to, to reduce a region or population to just those dismal issues is not how we're going to approach investigative. We want to have this kind of opening up the curiosity and wonder of the world approach, which often comes with some of the more uh, unsavory stories. Uh, but absolutely, we want to get a little more investigative. The thing I'm sure you, uh, that I know you're very aware of is those business models are tough. Uh, especially when you really expand and try to scale that. So having a superstar investigative is great, but focusing on curation, which by the way, every major news company does now. A lot of people say, oh, we're original. So many articles now begin as blank reported or everyone's reporting on the same social media uh, story or public data. So, but yeah, we want to get a little more investigative and, and do it in a unique way where it's a little more positive. 
You think like video though? Absolutely. Video is tough. Uh, very, very tough, but we're actually working on a couple of video trips this fall. So like, how, that are are really well how are you thinking about monetization? Is it mainly just native ads right now? Yeah. Ads yeah. are big. We want to get into e-commerce, whether that's partnering on a product or selling somehow. Uh, those are our main two ways. And, and, you know, we have the concern of, or our, more importantly, our readers have the concern that, okay, we don't want you to be swayed by having big advertisers and, and, you know, have pressure that they place, even if they're not explicit. But, you know, let's say you had, not that we would have big farm advertisers, but if you did, you'd be like, okay, are you, are you avoiding certain stories just to not upset the people who fill your coffers? To avoid that, we really want to get big on e-commerce and find out something or a way that people can support us and hopefully consume a great product without having us to resort to outside advertisers who could potentially exert or, or create a perception where they're exerting influence. Cause we would never let it happen, but there's definitely that perception. Is it mainly at this point, just native ads in the newsletter or are you doing actual sponsored posts for Instagram and TikTok yet? Uh, newsletter first. Uh -huh. We do a little bit on Instagram where we'll do story. Um, like, you know, not as in, not as in a, a story in the sense of, an entire, uh, you know, topic, but like on, on the Instagram stories. Uh, so at the top, we'll do that. And every once in a while, insert a slide promoting a product of some sort. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, Max, those were all the questions I have for you. Where can people find you online? Uh, they can find me on uh, on Instagram at Maximilian uh, two E, uh, the number two letter E, and then. Uh, also on TikTok at Max Tui spelled out where um, I actually uh, part of I moved around a lot as a as a kid and um, so I, I learned a lot about you know the different states and so on TikTok I have almost seven hundred thousand followers and I do a lot of informational stuff on states or kind of funny stuff so that actually has been on the personal where I, I also am so either one of those um, and uh, yeah. But more importantly, Roka News on, on Instagram, at Ride the News for the main page, Ride the Bench for the sports page, TikTok at Roka News, and uh, online, rokanews.com. All right. Well, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Simon, thank you so much. A blast.